there's nothing you know stopping me from from repatriating you know to the motherland yeah. I took care of everything I sold my old house the house that I lived in it would be 100 years old next year Ooh. so what I did I remodeled the house myself and I sold it I sold it for half the market value because I was I was ready to go Welcome back to my YouTube channel. My name is Clevy Joe. As usual, we are in the diaspora transition. Today we have our father with us living in Asebu, Kongolo, and we are here for him to share his experience with us too as well. So father, can you just tell us the journey of maybe your transition from America to Ghana? Yeah, my Ghana name is Mr. Kojo. Yeah. Kongol. Right. Monday born. Mm -hmm. And um, that's what most Ghanaians call me now. My diaspora name is Navigate More Freely. And I've been here in Ghana for, I, I arrived November the 2nd of 2019, the year of return. Nana Akufo Ado said 2019 is the year of return, so I return. Yeah, indeed you did. <laughs> yes, Nana Adanko Akufu Ado said I can stay here in Ghana. Yeah. So, I'm staying. So, well, after coming to Ghana for the first time, were you able to move back to America to um, make things right before you come back again? That, that was not necessary because I had already done my research and uh, I had been wanting to come to the motherland for decades. You know, and uh, so when I did decide, you know, that there's nothing, you know, stopping me from from repatriating, you know, to the motherland, yeah. I took care of everything. I sold my old house, the house that I lived in, it would be 100 years old next year. Ooh. So what I did, I remodeled the house myself and I sold it. I sold it for half the market value because I was I was ready to go. Right. So was it a gamble selling your house from America coming to Ghana? I didn't feel like it was a gamble because half the market value, you know, uh, you know, made it that I stayed in that house for decades for free. Okay. And and only thing I, I needed, you know, when it comes to Ghana is enough. Enough. I said all I need is enough to get me another house. Well I wasn't trying to stay there and be greedy. And squeeze everything out of out of there. It was time to go. So after two months of being here in Ghana, that's when COVID nineteen hit the world. Yeah. So and I was glad I was gone. Well, um, diasporas are saying that America or maybe Europe is being difficult to be to, to be there or maybe for you to stay there. They think Ghana is more cheaper than America or maybe Europe and so forth. You being an American and also coming to the motherland to, to show uh, the motherland, comparing these two, mm -hmm. which one is better? Well, that's a, that's a subjective term. You know, for me, this is more ideal because the weather is better here. You know, so there's only two seasons here in Ghana. That's summer and spring. Right. Whereas in the where I lived in the USA was Nebraska, it had four seasons: summer, spring, winter, and fall. So I like summer and spring. So the weather is better, the air is fresher. I've been here for four years and I've never seen a chemtrail in the sky as yet. 17% of respondents back in 2011 in an international survey said they believed the existence of a secret large-scale atmospheric spraying program to be true or partly true. 17%, that is literally millions and millions of Americans believing that it exists. And uh, you know, so as far as uh, cost effectiveness, it's cost effective, especially if you're getting paid in dollars or, or pounds or, or, or other uh, Western currency. Because you know Ghana is a is a is not a superpower. Ghana is a third world country, so Ghana's resources and economy is is totally controlled by the West. Well, you know the the indigenous Ghanaians are trying to move to America, 
Americans are also trying to move to Africa to stay. Mm-hmm. Comparing this to transition, mm-hmm. I want to understand something. Americans are saying Ghana is cheaper. Ghanaians are also saying that Americans, America is cheaper. So which one? Ghanaians are not saying America is cheaper because it's not. <laughs> it's not. It's definitely not cheaper. But I understand the psychology. There's method to this madness. Yeah. You see, like I said before, coming to Ghana, you know, it being paid in dollars, you know, is very cost effective. Right now, you know, one U.S. dollar will get you almost 16 Ghana CDs. Yeah. You know, and uh, and labor costs are less, even skilled labor, you know, and food, you know, uh, is is less because um, because of the the nature and uh, the food could be better because they, you know because uh, Ghanaians it's difficult to to poison them because they grow what they eat they eat what they grow and they like it right <laughs> so so you know that's um, one thing and as far as Ghanaians that go into the USA is logical they go to the USA to accumulate dollars. Mm-hmm. But they're smart enough to spend those dollars in Ghana. They go get the dollars there, send them here, which is very smart. Right. Most, most every country in, 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 on the continent of Africa, the indigenous people, they go to the USA or to the UK, the West, you know, to accumulate resources and send them here, you know, because you get more for your, your resources right. if you spend them here. If you spend them in the USA, you'll be struggling. It's difficult. Everything is much more expensive there. Right. So, so tell me, you living in Ghana for the past four years, over four years now, how was the experience and how was the experience? Well, uh, it's better than I thought it was going to be. I like it here, you know, because, uh, like I said, the weather is better. The food is healthier. The people are are very nice. I like the people. The people, you know, uh, you know, in the hood in the USA, it, it's, it's could be quite dangerous, you know, and uh, Ghana is not as dangerous as metropolitan areas in the USA, you know, because, uh, you know, take Chicago, for instance, you know, black men are shooting black men on a daily basis, and uh, black women, they're just as, just as dangerous. Here in Ghana, you know, uh, you don't have to watch your back as much, you know, as, the, you know, as, as you don't have to watch your back, you know, people here, you know, you got you can get ten thousand, you know, uh, Ghanaians in one area, and nobody acts crazy. Yeah. Nobody spoils the party. Right. You can only get fifty <laughs> black Americans <laughs> in an area, and somebody <laughs> gonna do something stupid. Right. So you know, uh, so uh, I find this place a whole lot better. See, in in, in the USA, if you approach someone. You know, as a black man, and I go talk to a black woman, you know, uh, uh, often than not, you know, you might get the words, nigga, please. <laughs> Whereas here in Ghana, if you, you know, you know, you talk to a lady, you know, she'll say, yes, please. Yeah. I like yes, please right. a whole lot better than I like nigga, right. please. I find it, you know, more, you know, more sensible and more relaxing and more pleasant, you know, to be dealing with Ghanaians than, 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 than plenty of black Americans. Now, don't get me wrong, there's cool black Americans too. Right. But there's a whole lot that's not that cool. Well, that is your experience. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, you to share your experience and, that, so. and here in Ghana, you know, I don't see those extremes. Yeah. You know, so in the USA, you have got to, you got to get in, you know, you got to find people, you know, that's, that's conducive to your, your sensibilities. And, uh, because there's, Plenty that are not. Well, how did you establish yourself in Ghana? Well, like I said, I sold my house and I, I reached the age of 62, so that means I can get early Social Security. And I, 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 I concluded that that would be enough to make the transition. So I made the tra- I sold everything and, and took care of all of my business in the USA because I was not planning on coming back no time soon, you know, because right. a round trip ticket to, you know, the USA is 
at least 1500 US dollars. At the time? At this time, too. Oh, okay. It's, it's plenty. 1500 US dollars times 15.6 or 7, that's a lot of Ghana CD. <laughs> so I, I'd rather spend that money on building. So I took care of everything and I, I came here and and uh, you landed in Accra and I lived in Accra for a year. I had a, you know, it, it took about six to eight months to, you know, to, to acquire this, this, this land. And, uh, and I was going back and forth from Accra to Central Region. And, uh, you know, and then I got another a place to live in, in, in Central Region and I let the one in Accra go. And so, and then I moved on onto my 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 plots that I I acquired. So, I, in, in, in your in your own way, how much did you bring to Ghana to establish yourself? Well, well, when I came to Ghana, what did I have? I had about seventy thousand U.S. dollars in my my account, and uh, with the monthly stipend, you know, on my Social Security. That was it. Mm. Now my bank account is finished. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not finished. At least you've had so many assets over here. So well, yeah, I've been building, and the seventy thousand is finished. And uh, now I just live. I, I, I have a, a um, what you call that? A set amount of money that I can manage and deal with per month. I'm on a on a, a limited income. So, have you per chance established any business that can um, generate more income for you? Not as yet. Not as yet. Uh, I, for the past four years, all I do is spend, spend, spend. So, I'm a net asset, you know, right. to Ghana. Because I haven't been pulling any money out of Ghana. I've just been putting it in. So, that makes me a net asset, which makes me feel good. I, you know, You know, eventually, you know, I will... Establish something that will make me a, some some CDs, but fortunately here in Ghana you don't have to make a lot of CDs, you know, to to live. Right. I uh, just got to just make something, you know, and uh, that'll be great, you know. And it, you know, the cost of living is less. It all depends on how you like to live, though. You know, because people in the USA they paying eight thousand dollars a month, you know, just to rent one apartment, you know, for for thirty days. Right. You know that kind of money. You know here in Ghana, it's you'll be. <laughs> if, you, if you earn those money in a month, you're gonna be a millionaire in Ghana. Yes, but they don't know that, <laughs> and uh, they rather spend all of their money, you know, in the USA, you know, and don't have nothing that that belongs to them, because that their that apartment that you're leasing for thirty days, it's not yours, and if your money, you know, has some way, you know, disappeared. Then you will have to disappear from that premise. So, here I have five times as much land, and I have um, I have four structures, you know, with roofs on. Them. Wow. <laughs> so, so, I, 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 and and it's it's growing, you know, slowly but surely because you know I'm not rich, but you can do more here with a little than you can in the U.S. A. Hey. You know, not that I couldn't live in the USA. I could have stayed there as well, you know, and managed that one too with what I had, yeah. you know, because my home was paid for and I was saving a thousand US dollars a month, you know, but I didn't want to be there anymore. Right. Well, you, you came to a Cebu Pan African village, um, mingling with the locals over here. How were you able to cope with your culture? And also their languages and even their attitude. Well, the attitudes here is, is like I told you, is wonderful. You know, Ghanaians have a, a, a much better attitude than than plenty of Black Americans. You know, you know the the attitude here is you know by and you know by and large is you know it's acceptable and palatable and. and uh, what was the rest of the question? Well, the languages, the languages. Oh, the languages. Yeah. You know, well, I've always liked, you know, African languages. You know, when I was in grade school, like 
seventh or eighth grade, I had a, a teacher that it was teaching us some Swahili, you know, so that was very interesting. Yeah. You know, Jambo, si Jambo. Yeah. You know, so that was, and then, you know, uh, when I, I joined, when I went to college, you know, I, I had a Zulu class, you know, Saubon, Yebo <laughs> Saubon. And I love that, you know, and I even taught my daughter a little bit of Zulu. Gitanda Ubaba. Mm hmm. That means I love you, yeah. Daddy. Yeah. <laughs> so that was pretty nice. I was enjoying it, and uh, in 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 the USA, I met plenty of of of, of native Africans coming to USA. You know, people from all over. You know, uh, uh, coming from Togo, and my Togolese friends, they they they, they gave me you know the name Kangol. So I told you my Ghanaian name is Mr. Mr. Kojo Kongo. So it's a combination of Ghana yeah. and, and Togo. Yeah, well, Kongolo is, is, is not a Togolese name, but that's the name, you know, they helped me establish. So Kongolo is like 35 years old. Kongolo is not a little boy anymore. Now, Kojo, he's only like four years old. <laughs> <laughs> but Kongolo, you know, I had that name in the USA. Yeah, it's an and, old name. Yes, and they taught me a little bit of Mina. That's one of their languages is Mina. I can't remember any of the Mina right now. And, uh, and there was, I had African friends from Sudan, Togo, uh, African friends from, you know, different so, places. So, uh, apart from Ghana, have you by chance visit, uh, visited any African country so far? No, no, no. no. I, just, I haven't been to any other African countries as yet. But I, I hope to, <clears throat> to visit some because there's plenty of places I would love to go. You know, my number one uh, ideal place before I came was South Sudan. South wow. Sudan. I, that, that, I'm very, I find South Sudan very intriguing. I like well, it. What was the inspiration behind that? The people, you know, and the people of the South Sudan, South Sudanese that I met in the USA, you know, they were much younger than I was, but, you know, uh, they were really, really terrific people. And, uh, uh, you know, my, my Taekwondo instructor was half my age in the USA. And, uh, you know, now they, you know, they, they are, that's been years ago, so now they have children that's, that is reaching right. adult yeah. age now. Mm -hmm. So, you know, South Sudan was was very interesting, you know, but I didn't go there because at the time I thought it wouldn't be safe, you know, as far as wars is concerned. So, so Ghana was the next best choice, which is pretty good. Well, you know, in Africa, we are just trying to change the dynamics. That is why we, the YouTubers, are also trying to change things. This kind of civil war, tribal war, whatever is happening in Africa we are doing our possible best to change all those things that is why we are changing the narrative we have to write our own narratives for people that are living in the diaspora from america europe uk or whatever they should know that africa is no more the old africa that they knew yes you know they polluted you guys your mindsets you folks they polluted your mindsets and so forth about africa but africa is not as bad as they normally pollute you guys too. that's true and some of us, you know, from the di diaspora, we are totally aware of that. And uh, you know what we what we do is we let, you know, the the uh, the continental the local uh, Africans know that many of these wars that they ha they are fighting is is fomented by the West. Divide and conquer is one of the oldest tricks in their book in their arsenal. You know, so you know it was a in Sudan it was. North Sudan against South Sudan. You know, what, what happened was they found all that oil in South Sudan. So, you know, uh, if Africans are killing each other, you know, the West, you know, just say that just make it easier for us to, to exploit the resources. Simple as that. Right. It's not rocket science. Yeah. You know, so, you know, uh, as soon as the, the continental Africans, you know, uh, become aware of the exploitations and, and, and try to push back on it, you know, the better the continent will be. And, uh, you know, and we in the diaspora, especially in the USA, we recognize, you know, uh, what's going on. We're sophisticated people. We've been educated. We, many of us, many of us know how to think for ourselves and see the handwriting on the wall. And uh, it would be negligent for us not 
you know, to inform, you know, our continental African brothers and sisters, you know, what's really going on, in our opinion. So, per what you are saying, if I'm supposed to give you a rule, you being an American and also a Ghanaian now, let me label it, you are a Ghanaian, but it was because of a situation that you landed into America. Now you've known the truth. People are living in the diaspora in America and so forth. What are you going to tell them about Africa? How would you change your mindset so that they will know that Africa is a good place for them to live? Well, I'm not going to try to change their mindset. I'm just going to tell the truth and let them, you know, um, make their own decisions. You know, because, you know, I don't advocate, you know, that everybody, all black Americans, you know, uh, of, of African descent leave the USA. You know, the USA belongs to, uh, you know, us just as much as it belongs to anybody. You know, we were there first. <laughs> so, you know, just because, you know, we was exploited, you know, don't mean we have to leave, you know, with a, you know, no, no, no. The world wouldn't be safe that way. That's the, that's exactly what the, you know, the, the imperialists would love to see all of us come into one area and then they can control us. Yeah. That's what they're trying to do with everybody right now. Right. Everybody, white, black, and everybody else in these these uh, small cities with electric cars and where we can't go nowhere, where they can control us. Right. Just like COVID. They said, everybody be incarcerated in your house, mm -hmm. you know, so they can control us. Yeah. So, you know, it would be, you know, see, right now, black Americans are in the USA. They, you know, many of them should not leave, especially the younger ones. Because if something goes down, you know, in the continent of Africa or, or whatever, they're in the living room and they can break up the furniture. Right. That's true. That's true. Well, my final two questions that I want to ask you, it's about living in Ghana. Nice. Though. Yeah. Maybe it might be very difficult, but I know you pass it. It's an exam that I'm giving you. Would you mind if we change the interview language to Fanti? My fanti is kan 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 kan. Small, small. <laughs> so I'm trying. I'm learning. You okay. know. So you know, I'm test. learning my fanti. You know. <laughs> you know, when I I, I greet people at, at the scene, you know, uh, uh, I, I greet them. You know, in, in fanti, and they enjoy it. And uh, you know, and when I was in Accra, you know, it was it was ga. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I try to pick up as much language as I can, yeah. although the Ghanaian's English is better than my Fanti or my uh, Ga, you know, because they teach English in the schools here. They don't teach Fanti in the schools in the USA, nor do they teach Ga. Matter of fact, you know, it, you, it's rare that you would see any African language being taught in the USA. But, you know... It, it, plenty of, of black Americans and other Americans, they have trouble speaking English. <laughs> Their English is not that good either. So, you know, but I try, I try to pick up, you know, the um, local dialect of English. That's what I tell my diaspora and friends, you know, you just can't talk to, to uh, uh, local people just like I'm talking right now, you know, with straight, uncut English. You know, you got to speak the dialect, the English dialect. Well, my last two questions that I want to ask you is about some Americans have been painting Africans that Africans are not trustworthy, Africans are this, Africans are that. Sometimes, too, they bring the American life to Ghana. Always I keep telling my people that are watching me out there that if you are from America coming to Ghana, the first thing you need to pack is your patience. So as you were coming to Ghana, what was the first thing that you were considering before coming to Ghana? Uh, consuming cultural culture. Because, you know, when you come to the come from the USA, if you're not orientated, you know, to consume culture you're going to suffer from cultural shock because you're not going to find everything here in Ghana like it is in the USA, you know. So if USA is your ideal and you cannot adjust, you know, to a different cultural setting, you're going to have some difficulties. And many uh, diasporans come here, you know, 
and say, we don't do it that way. I want this done just like they do in the USA. You know, they, they, they stuck on it. You know, they can't, as far as change is concerned, they can't change. You know, they, 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 they have certain expectations. And if, they, if their expectations aren't met from what they used to, they're miserable. You know, but cultural change, you know, uh, you know, uh, some, some things cultural, I, I, I don't just incorporate into my life. You know, but plenty of stuff that's cultural here, you know, here in, in the continent is good to consume. So, you know, you, it, it all depends on having enough courage to consume culture and understand culture, adjust to culture, because I'm not in the USA. So, you know, um, I have to conform. Even in the USA, you have to conform. You know, you don't have the freedom to do anything you want to do or act any way you want to act, you know, without consequence. So here in Ghana, it's, it's much more pleasant because Ghanaians, they, they get along. You got Muslims, Christians, all kinds of people, you know, living in the same community, and they all get along. Nobody is putting anybody down or attacking anyone, and so it's peaceful. So my last question, since you are living in a fancy community, at least you might have tasted fancy food. Yo. You know, various, you have various kinds of food, the airway food, the fancy, the hausa, the gao, the goosey, and so Yo, on. that means yes. Yeah. Yo. So. The food is, you know, the food is, you know, it's an, some of it is an acquired taste if you're from the West. Because uh, us diasporans from the USA, we have sophisticated taste buds. That means, you know, we go to Walmart and get anything we want. Mm -hmm. We go to the super, super duper market, you know. Yeah. And it's everything, anything, everything. Mm -hmm. You just get what you want. If you got the, the resources, the funds, you can buy anything you want. It's right there at your fingertips. We're here in Ghana, especially around here. You know, uh, when you go, you only have a market. The market day is on Saturdays here. And when you go to the market, everybody, you know, most a lot of people are selling the same thing. Right. You know, you know, everybody is selling the same thing because everybody eats the same thing. And, uh, and, and you don't have processed food here. You have everything fresh, organic, straight out of the garden, plantain, tomatoes, garlic, onions. You know, uh, sweet potatoes, uh, corn, uh, uh, all kinds of stuff. Okra, uh, you know, uh, and, and you know, you have all kinds of stuff that that's, that's grown at the market, and everybody's half the people are selling the same thing. Right. You know, because Ghanaian have a, a a cultural cuisine, so you know it, it takes a it's an acquired taste, you know, to to get get used to the cultural cuisine. Uh, and uh, if you want, if you want to go back to the diaspora cuisine, you have to go to a supermarket that will help you accommodate that, you know. And uh, there's not that many around here, so you have to travel a little bit distance. And then when you get to the supermarket, you might not find everything you want anyway. Right. So, so it's an adjustment. It's a <laughs> cultural adjustment to the cuisine. And uh, I like, um, I like okra stew and bunku. Mm -hmm. So I had somebody prepared bunku for me, and uh, and I'm going to go to the market today and buy a bunch of okra, and uh, you know I'm going to try to prepare it myself this time. Mm -hmm. You know. And, uh, <laughs> well, basically, let me come in. I'm not trying to be a biased person, but okra yeah. stew and bunku is basically for hours. Well, I don't know. Airways, airways are the best in that. That is the best food. <laughs> well, I, I, I don't know. The, I don't know airways. I would know airway from a front. <laughs> they are the same to me in a dog. Right. So we all and, got here. Yes. Yeah. I would not know, you know, because in, in, even in Accra, you know, in the Ga community, they were eating the same thing they eat in the Fanti community. Yeah. Ga likes kinky. Yes. Yeah. I like Ga kinky better yeah, right. than I do Fanti kinky. Yeah. Fanti kinky. Nah. But God can give you, oh yeah. <laughs> Dapun. <laughs> Dapun. That's what you say. Yeah. That's the name of Kinky. You know, in Fanti. Dapun. Sukwe. I, I chop Dapun. Sukwe. Yeah. Chop means eat. 
Yeah. <laughs> so you have to speak the mm-hmm. you have to speak the, speak the local English dialect, you know, for <laughs> to be understood. Yes. And I like to be understood. You know, communication is a, a little bit of a challenge. You know, but the Ghanaian's English is a whole lot better than our Fanti. <laughs> well, your final words, your final words for people that are watching you on YouTube. Well, um, I would say, you know, Nana Adankwa Akufo-Addo, the current president of Ghana, he once said that Ghana is not a paradise. But what he forgot to say, that it could be everything here to transform this place into a paradise. And some areas here are paradise. You know, this is a third world country, so therefore the infrastructure is not as built up as it would be in the USA. But there's infrastructure being built. And it's, you know, there's very nice places here. I have an half, half an acre of land, which is five times more than I had in the USA. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, everything, you know, is developing, you know. So I, I recommend that the retirees, you know, like around my age, come to Ghana and build. You know, build for the future for those who stay in the USA on on that on that line, because um, if 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 challenges come, it's going to be the young men, you know, and the young women, you know, that that fights the the, the physical battles. Yeah, it's not going to be as old folks, you know. We we're going to you know put in the intellectual uh, uh, properties, you know, and and let people know what's going on and. And, and, and funnel our resources, you know, into the right areas. So when everything is settled, you know, there's some place for them to come. Right. You know, we want. I, I want to build a legacy project here where where family and friends, you know, when their when their time comes, they can come. You know, with no struggle, no problems. You know, but right now in the USA, the the borders are wide open. Millions upon millions of of, of military age men and women are pouring into the USA and they're, and, and, and they're pouring into the USA for a reason. They're not pouring in the, the excuse is they want to come, you know, to the USA for a better life. Nobody's going to have a better life, you know, with that many people pouring into the USA. Right. They're not going to have a better life and the, people, the citizens is already there is not going to either. But that's not the reason why they're really being poured in the USA. They've been poured in there, you know, because they're, they're, they're going to, it's an army, you know. So, you know, Kamala Harris is the border czar, but she's recruiting her army. That's why the border is wide open for her army to just to pour right on in, you know. And uh, so black Americans, white Americans, everybody that's citizens, if they take your guns, you're in big trouble. See, Ghana here, you know, is a, you know, is not a threat to no one. So therefore, I, I I figure you know that that the powers will leave us alone because we're not a threat. Right. You know they they say we'll take care of them once we get you know handle the threat. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so so that's the way I see it. I see the world is going through some changes right now, and okay. uh, and all those gangsters in those big cities in the USA, you better lock and load, you know, because uh, you might need to, yeah. you know. So, so, so how hard you really is, you know, you hard against each other. Right. Uh, are you going to be hard against the threat? <laughs> that's the question. That is it. So, guys, as you are watching, this is Clary Joe TV. You need to subscribe to our channel. Just keep following us, share our videos to each and everybody in the diaspora or maybe all over the world, you know, and keep liking our videos too. Bye-bye.